Hi. Hi. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker of this session, Yaki Lang, who will speak about uh, quantum algorithms for escaping from subtle points. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jachi Lan uh, from the University of Maryland. Uh, and uh, today my talk is about uh, a quantum algorithm for escaping from subtle points. It's a joint work uh, with Chen Yi Zhang and Tong Yang Li. Uh, so, um, Chen Yi is from Tsinghua University and Tong Yang is now at MIT. So, um, okay, the basic problem sitting here is the general optimization problem. We have this real valued uh, function supported in the n dimensional real space, and we want to find the global minimizer of this function. So, for uh, this problem, this is a core topic in a lot of different uh, branches of uh, sciences, including mathematics theoretical computer science, uh, operations research, et cetera. And recently there has been a significant interest from machine learning community that they find training a machine learning model is actually equivalent to optimize a loss function. So as a group of theorists, we are quite interested to explore that if we can provide any plurable guarantee for solving, solving such an optimization problem. Uh, so before we get to the bigger picture, we want to review some uh, results from the convex optimization, which is a well-established theory. Uh, so here, a uh, convex optimization problem can be solved in poly time uh, with classical algorithms, for example, ellipsoid method, interior points uh, uh, method, etc. So for a classical method, we can do uh, the problem with poly time in dimension and polylog in one over epsilon. So here epsilon is the um, uh, error level. And for a state of the art result, we can do this problem with uh, n squared query complexity and n cube time complexity. Uh, and this work is credited to Lee Sitford and Van Pala. Uh, for quantum, uh, we can actually speed up this result a little bit. Uh, we assume that we have this quantum evaluation oracle, and you can see here. Uh, and by using this oracle, we can um, solve the problem. We can have a quantum speed up basically in the query complexity. It's linear in n, the dimension. But for the time complexity, it seems that we do not have a significant speed up. It's also uncubed. And I believe this result is, uh, was appeared in QIP 2019, uh, joined by uh, Chabarati, Q, uh, Charles Li Wu, and also another group by Apeldor, uh, Gillian uh, Gribbin and De Wolf. Okay, so now uh, let's look at the uh, non-convex optimization problem in machine learning. Uh, there are actually two concerns about this result in the practice of machine learning. So uh, for loss functions of machine learning models, they are typically non-convex. Uh, and also for many practical models, especially for those arising from say deep learning uh, models, we have very, very huge dimension number, which means the N is super large, usually at the magnitude of millions or even billions. So for those problems, uh, we should accommodate very large dimension N but still we can tolerate reasonably large epsilon, the error. Uh, so speaking of the probable guarantee, maybe we want to pursue an algorithm that can uh, solve the problem with poly log dependence in the dimension, but maybe poly in one over epsilon. Uh, and you can see this is slightly different from what we have in the context of convex optimization where we have poly dependence in dimension and poly log dependence in one over epsilon. So for uh, this kind of algorithm with polylog dependence in dimension, we call them dimension-free methods. And this is the main topic that we're gonna talk about today. Um, so for uh, also some more facts about learning problems. So usually finding the global minima is NP hard, which means it's intractable in practice. We find it's usually hopeless to find the correct global minima in practice. But luckily the major difficulty is usually not local minima. This is, this is because maybe we can have many local minima, but still many of them will give us the performance as good as global minima. So we don't have to worry about them too much. 
However, on the other side, saddle points are also ubiquitous in those problems, and they can give us highly uh, suboptimal solutions. So uh, considering this situation, we draw the conclusion that we want to find some algorithm that can help us to escape from saddle points. Uh, but we're satisfied with just reaching an absolute approximated local minima. Uh, here is the technical uh, definition that we adopt in the paper, uh, but uh, it looks a bit complicated, but I can give you some insights of it. So basically we have first order condition, second order condition. The first order condition says we are satisfied with a uh, point that has a very small uh, gradient information, the gradient the norm of the gradient is bounded by epsilon, uh, while the uh, sm smallest eigenvalue for this point, uh, I mean, the smallest eigenvalue for the Hessian matrix at this point should be uh, greater than some negative number. So, so that it's like very close to zero and it's unlikely to be a saddle point. Uh, okay, so let's look at the main idea of how to escape from saddle points. Uh, usually we adopt this proposal, it's called perturbed gradient descent or PGD. Uh, we can just look at this picture to gain more intuition. So suppose that you are running some optimization algorithm and you're getting close to the set of point. And because the uh, gradient information is kind of vanishing in the, uh, this region, so uh, we have very slow progress here. And here the proposal is that we can shake the point a little bit say uh, you can have the point uh, magically uh, end up here, and then we are, again have significant gradient information, then you can just uh, do some gradient descent and then the update will just uh, escape from the set of point. But in terms of practice, there are a few uh, aspects that we should take care of. For example, what's the radius of the perturbation? If the radius is too, too big, then probably you can end up somewhere uh, here which is bad, but uh, maybe here, then you're good. But if you end up somewhere here, then uh, it seems that it, it's very efficient. We have to do green descent uh, some a lot of many times uh, th and then end up here again. But if the radius of perturbation is too small, then it's also inefficient because you don't get very far away from the set of point. Um, for the way of perturbation, uh, it's also a very crucial problem. Like what's the most efficient approach to escape from set point? For a gradient descent method, uh, we have standard gradient descent, we have a stochastic gradient descent, but we can also ask if we have faster versions of them. So, okay, uh, here is the classical proposal for escaping from set points. Uh, we do uniform perturbation in a ball plus the so-called accelerated gradient descent. Uh, I'll explain those terms uh, later, but here uh, the take home message is that the complexity for the state of the art classical proposal is uh, uh, log, uh, log to the power of six uh, in terms of dimension and uh, one over epsilon to 1.75. Uh, this is by Jane Netropoli and Jordan. So for the uniform perturbation in a ball, that means if we uh, are close to the saddle point, then we just uh, draw a circle or a ball uh, around this, uh, this saddle point or around the point that we are, we are now at. And then uh, we have equal chance to end up any point in this ball. And uh, with decent chance, we can end up some, some point like uh, quite far away from the saddle point. Uh, which means we have, again, uh, quite good gradient information, then you can do gradient descent. And here the accelerated gradient descent um, is also called Nesterov's accelerated gradient descent. This is by Nesterov. Uh, and uh, basically it's a faster version of gradient descent. We can include some momentum information in the update to speed up uh, the descent process. And here, uh, what about our quantum proposal? So the main observation is that uh, if we have a Gaussian wave pocket and uh, we also have a, a potential function that has a saddle point, uh, say maybe at the origin, and we just let the Gaussian wave pocket to disperse uh, or to evolve uh, like uh, as time goes by and uh, the Gaussian wave pocket will 
um, disperse very fast along the negative curvature direction, which is the direction of the negative eigenvalues. And also for set points, we know we usually have the negative curvature direction. So uh, here is the numerical simulation of this process. So we start with the standard Gaussian wave pocket and the potential is not show, shown here, but uh, I can tell you it's a set of point. Uh, it's a potential with set of point here. And you can see with very short time, the wave pocket uh, began to kind of disperse along the X direction, which is the negative uh, eigen, uh, the direction for the negative eigenvector. Um, so based on this observation, we can give a hybrid quantum classical algorithm uh, such that the perturbation itself is replaced by measuring this squeezed Gaussian wave function. And then we can apply the gradient descent. Uh, of course, we apply the accelerated gradient descent to uh, this problem. And we end up with this complexity, which is a uh, square of log of n over one, uh, one over epsilon to 1.75. So compared to the classical state of the art result, we have a cubic speed up in terms of dimension, but for the epsilon, we just match the state of the result. Uh, so here are, are a few more concrete points. So first, how do we prepare the square state? Um, easy, it's a it's an easy thing. We just let it evolve like quantum, right? And here I just give you uh, a toy model for this process. Uh, you just consider this Schrodinger equation, say maybe one dimensional Schrodinger equation. And uh, we are now near a set point. So the function, potential function itself can be well approximated by a quadratic function, usually take this form. And we have a parameter lambda in this form. So this parameter shows that uh, um, the point zero has different property in terms of different lambda. If lambda is positive, then we have a local minima. If lambda is zero, then it's just flat and we have a free particle. If lambda is negative, then we just have a local maxima. Or if we can have a several, uh, uh, if we can have this potential function in higher dimension, then you can imagine for some directions we have negative lambda. So, so this toy model can actually give us a lot of information of what's going on in high dimensional case. Uh, and if the initial wave function is chosen to be Gaussian, which means the distribution of the position quadrature follows the standard normal distribution. And we let it evolve for some positive time according to this Schrodinger equation. The, pos the position quadrature will still follow a normal distribution, but with a very different variance here. Uh, and the variance itself can be solved analytically. And we just give the formula here. Uh, the formula looks a bit uh, a little bit weird, complicated, uh, and uh, we can just uh, take some observation from it. So the key message is that if we have a positive lambda, then you see the variance disperse exponentially fast uh, with respect to time. Uh, if we have a zero lambda, which means we just have a free particle, um, then the uh, variance still dispersed, but it's at a quadratic speed uh, in time as well. But if we have a negative lambda, which means we have sort of like the uh, negative eigenvalue kind of uh, situation in the case, uh, then you see um, the variance itself looks like some, um, oh, sorry, yeah. So, uh, sorry, I, I just made some mistakes. So uh, for neg negative lambda, we have exponentially fast dispersion, which corresponds to this case. Uh, for positive lambda, we have uh, the uh, local minima case. And for this, we have the variance bounded by some constant, which is some uh, trig functions. Uh, so for our algorithm, uh, this observation just shows that if, we're, if we are near a set point, and if at least one eigenvalue is quite negative, uh, which should be less than this threshold, then the quantum wave function will immediately leaks along those negative eigen directions, just like this situation in exponentially fast speed. So compared with the uniform perturbation proposal in the, in the classical method, we actually make use of the geometry which, uh, of the landscape, which is actually the source of our quantum speed up from my point of view. Um, 
another problem is what's the cost for preparing such a squeeze state? Uh, the short answer is the cost for the quantum simulation is cheap on quantum computer, uh, but uh, not for a classical computer. As we know, simulating large quantum systems is very difficult for classical computers. This is because the cost usually scales exponentially with, re with respect to the dimension n. And if we are at some practical problems, uh, if n is like millions or even billions, then you can imagine the cost is just um, hopeless. But if we have a quantum computer, uh, it's actually particularly good for simulating quantum systems. And the cost only scales polynomially with respect to the dimension of n. And this, is, this result uh, was by Charles Leo and Ostrander. So we just make use of this result and eventually we combine all the ingredients together and we give this quantum algorithm. Uh, this is an overview. So first we start with the initial guess X node and then we compute the gradient. If the gradient is very large, then we're happy. We just apply accelerated gradient descent. If the gradient is small, then we may have two situations. Um, we can have some uh, local minima, which is good because uh, our goal is to find local minima. But uh, we can also have saddle point nearby, which is bad, and we want to use our algorithm to get rid of it. So now we just run the quantum simulation with the time uh, and the time dependencies uh, log of n linear in log of n. And after this time, we just measure the wave function uh, with the position quadrature, of course. And if that's indeed a saddle point, then you can imagine we can end up with some point very, um, very far away from the saddle point. And uh, this is usually with very high probability. But if the point, is, uh, if the gradient is small and we are close to a local minima, and we also run the quantum simulation, you can imagine that uh, the variance is sort of bounded and we will not go very far away. And then we apply the accelerated green descent for another uh, linear in log of n iterations. And we iterate these processes for uh, several times, like constant times. Um, and then it turns out that we can find the uh, epsilon approximated local minima. And another point to be pointed out is that uh, in all of those algorithms, we compute the gradient by using the Jordan's algorithm, uh, which only use the quantum evaluation oracle. So this, this idea has been used in, in some previous works. Um, and this is shown to, uh, they, they actually use the Jordan's algorithm to convex optimization. But in our case, we generalize the setting to non-convex optimization. And uh, this is our overall um, summary. So compared to the prior arts uh, in the classical community, we achieve a uh, cubic speed up in terms of the dimension. And uh, we match the epsilon dependence. You see the, the it's uh, both of them are one over epsilon to 1.75. Uh, another thing we achieve is that we replace the original one, uh, first order classical oracle with a zeroth order quantum evaluation oracle. So, um, so this is actually a summary of our work. Uh, so now I want to provide some numerical experiments of our uh, works. Uh, we have in total four experiments in the, in the paper. So if you're interested, uh, you can just check them. Uh, and here due to the time limitation, I only want to highlight, uh, highlight two of them. So the first is that we run the simulation over a non-quadratic potential. As you can see, um, we only do a um, quadratic potential in our analysis. Uh, for a non-quadratic potential, it's actually quite difficult to kind of analyze the uh, provable guarantees, but uh, we can easily do this using numerics. Uh, so here, let me explain what's going on here. Um, we want to evolve a, quant a Gaussian wave pocket over this non-quadratic potential function. It's a cubic function. And the counter plot of this function has been shown like uh, as, a, as the background you can see here. And we show the wave pocket itself by uh, using the heat map. And we just covered the heat map over the contour. 
and you see at the at uh, at the um, original point uh, when time equals to zero, um, the wave pocket looks like a Gaussian shape, and then we let it evolve with a short time, and it quickly disperses along uh, the negative the uh, curvature direction. Um, and you see when the wave uh, hits the boundary of, of our simulation uh, domain, we have some uh, interference pattern near the boundary, which is clearly some quantum phenomenon. You can also uh, observe this kind of behavior in, in this plot as well. And what you can imagine is that uh, with some time, um, within a very short time actually, the wave pocket will distribute quite evenly in this valley. This is like the value for low function value. And then at this point, you just evaluate, uh, uh, sorry, you just measure the wave pocket. And then with very high chance, you'll end up like some, somewhere here. And this point, uh, we have very large gradient uh, information. And then you just run gradient descent and quickly will just uh, flow away from this. Um, another experiment is uh, about dimension dependence because this is our major claim in the paper. Uh, we claim we have a cubic speed up uh, in terms of the prior art. So here we want to actually check this claim. Uh, so the setting is that we create an objective function uh, with various dimensions. Uh, we, we have three cases uh, with dimension ranging from 10, 100, all the way to 1000. So for like 1000 dimensional case, it's uh, close to our potential applications uh, like machine learning or other uh, big data problems. So uh, for the objective function, we intentionally set it to be the case that uh, we only have one direction for negative eigenvalues, but um, all the other directions we have positive eigenvalues. So this problem is actually difficult. You are gonna find the only negative direction out of uh, say 1000 1, dimensions. So for quantum evolution time, uh, we set it to be linear in P and here P is actually log of the N if you take the base to be 10. Uh, for classical iteration number, uh, which is the iteration number for the gradient descent, we take it to be quadratic in P, but for quantum iteration number, we take it to be also linear in P and we take 1,000 initial guesses for both methods, both for quantum and classical. And then uh, we just uh, measure the result. And this plot for uh, the y-axis, it's the frequency, uh, which is the statistics of the result. And for the x-axis is the categories that uh, how much uh, decrease in the function value we achieve. And for the red, it represents the, uh, per, uh, the, the classical method. And for the blue one, it shows the quantum method. And as you can see, uh, we have uh, basically a comparable performance for both methods, but um, quantum can actually do slightly better than classical because uh, for this range, it's considered that the decrease in the function value is not super huge. But uh, as the x uh, axis extend, we can imagine it's kind of more efficient function value it decrease. So quantum can do comparable with classical in this setting uh, with the dimension with, with sort of like a square root speed up. Uh, so this is actually an interesting observation because our theory says we have a cubic speed up, but here experiments suggest that we only have a square root speed up. So we guess that it might be the case that the classical uh, state of the R result is not sharp. We can still push forward uh, a little bit, but still this is an open question. Uh, we do not solve this yet. Uh, other open questions here are, um, maybe we can provide some quantum inspired classical algorithm for escaping from set point, which means perhaps we want to dequantize the quantum algorithm. Uh, we don't know if that's possible, but still this is a good observation. Uh, for quantum algorithms, we do not have speed up in terms of one over epsilon. So we are curious to know if we can have any speed up in terms of this term. Uh, and also another more challenging question is beyond the local minima, can we actually achieve any quantum advantage for approaching global minima? Can we use any phenomena like a quantum tunneling, uh, like motivated by the adiabatic algorithm in this process? We're still unclear about this. Um, so that's all for the talk. Thanks for your attention. 
and maybe it's time for question. Thank you for this uh, very nice talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, some uh, Chang Feng Shao asked uh, just a bit clarification why you want to escape from saddle points. If you can just say a few words about it. Uh, yeah, so, so, okay, so I think the major motivation is that um, saddle points are the number one enemy in practice, especially in the practice of machine learning. Um, this is because for the loss function of machine learning models, it's usually very non-convex, uh, which means we can have a lot of local minima and we can have uh, saddle points as well. And as I said, local minima is usually not a big problem for us, but saddle points are problems for us because they can give us bad performance for those models. So in terms of practice, uh, especially in the context of machine learning, we just want to escape from saddle point. And this is uh, like the thing that can really help us to boost up the performance for those models. Yes. Okay. Uh, and another question I, I, I was wondering about, <clears throat> so you have this analytical solution to this uh, time evolution in case you happen to be at an exactly a quadratic uh, point, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but in your algorithm, uh, you mm -hmm. said that you just uh, continue normal gradient descent until you reach a point where you have small gradients and that, well, mm -hmm. if, if the gradient is not exactly zero, you are not exactly at a saddle point. So how robust is this result to, to such like uh, small perturbations that you are not actually a subtle point just near to one, say? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. And I believe this is a question raised by one of the reviewers. Uh, so in our current version of the paper on archive, you can actually find we add this uh, discussion for the robustness, which means if you are if you start at some point which is slightly like off the saddle point, but also very close to it, and then you let the uh, algorithm run like what we described by following the Schrodinger equation, then still we can have the analytical solution for the evolution, which is uh, very magical, <laughs> I think. Again, we, we can have the formula for the normal distribution in terms of the position quadrature. We can derive a formula for the mean and also for variance. Uh, the message is that for the mean, it follows a uh, classical like behavior. Say you can imagine the particle to be like a classical particle and the dynamics is just a classical Hamiltonian dynamics. Then the mean will just follow the classical trajectory like flow away from the saddle point and the variance doesn't change in that case. So which means our uh, observation is still valid and also it applies to the more general case that we do not start from the saddle point itself. And we also add some more proofs and uh, very rigorous discussion about how this will uh, affect the uh, discussion in our afterwards um, steps. And the uh, overall result is that our complexity bound doesn't change in terms of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there is another question by Matthias Caro, which is the last question I guess we have time mm -hmm. for is whether do you have an intuition on whether the dimension dependence in your result can be further improved? Um, in what sense, the classical or quantum? Uh, uh, I guess the, the quantum. Yeah, so uh, for the numerical experiment that we have now, we do not really look into the case that we can, if we can achieve any speed up in terms of quantum dimension dependence, because you can see uh, this is actually much faster than classical. But uh, from my personal point of view, I think maybe it's hard to push quantum any further because in our uh, theory, we already uh, have a lot of our approximations that captures the main structure of the problem. We assume that we are uh, near a set point and it's approximated by a quadratic form. And for that case, I think uh, all the results are pretty close to the tight result because you cannot imagine that we can have any other extra structures to make use of. So maybe for the quantum case, um, so for myself, I don't think we have good chance to even push forward the quantum dimension dependence. But for the classical, as the experiment itself shows, we may have a chance to push forward the uh, dimension dependence from the uh, sixth power to fourth power, I guess, maybe. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so now everyone who wants to ask further questions can go to the round table, which you can immediately go there if you want, but it will officially only start after this session concluded. <clears throat> so thank you for the talk once more. <clears throat>